So uh, welcome to the Ozoza Lifestyle Crucial Conversations podcast. Today's topic is African modern art, growth and global influences. To explore this subject, we are honored to have the very accomplished artist Oliver Awomo with us. Oliver Awomo is the president of the Society of Nigerian Artists, the umbrella professional body for all practicing visual artists in Nigeria. He also runs Omenka Gallery, which showcases African art, Omenka Online, which sells African art online, Revillo, a publishing company, and the Benuomo Foundation. He holds a master's degree in, uh, with distinction from the University of Lagos, Nigeria. He comes from a long line of artists. His grandfather was a reputable traditional sculptor and his late father, Professor Ben Owomo, was widely celebrated as Africa's pioneer modernist. In his work, Oliver Owomo elevates black culture to challenge racial injustice and systemic racism by celebrating the cultural, political, and socioeconomic achievements of Africans through an examination of African spirituality, black identity, and migration, contemporary African politics, Pan-Africanism, and the Global African Empowerment Movement. Welcome, Oliver Wombo. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for having me on your podcast. We're very, very honored to have you with us. Um, I'm so happy to be here as well. Thank you. So as an introduction, I would like to ask you, how would you define uh, modern art in general? Um, I'd say that modern art is a break, an ideological break from uh, the academic style that prevailed at that time uh, as an ideological break from that uh, into um, um, a leaning towards uh, the abstract. You know, the academic style was viewed as uh, in stiff, you know, and the artists at that time wanted something more fluid where they could express themselves even better. And this uh, movement happened, I think, um, towards the end of the 19th century, I'll say the turn of the 19th century. So it crystallized at that time. So it's an ideological break from the academic style prevalent at that time. Interesting. Uh, what, what would you say the global modern art movement, when, when would you say it started? So you've said sort of the end of the 19th century. Are yes. there any key, key names you can mention who are part of this movement globally? Yes, I'd say uh, artists like Pablo Picasso, um, Claude Monet, Henri Matisse, um, these were Jackson Pollock, the American who, you know, was vital to abstract expressionism from the 1950s. Um, these are some of the artists that uh, I'd say the very prominent the protagonist of that uh, movement. Yes, it's interesting to see the development started at the end of the, uh, the 19th century. So yes. from this, you know, the, the industrial revolution really coming into full flow. Um, I'd yes. like to, you know, I'd like to sort of mention a quote um, by, your, um, by, your, by, your, by your father, Benawombo, in 1989. So he said, I will not accept an inferior position in the art world, nor have my art called African because I have not correctly and properly given expression to my reality. I have consistently fought against that kind of philosophy because it is bogus. European artists like Picasso, Braque, and Vlaminck were influenced by African arts. Everybody sees that and is not opposed to it. But when they see an African artist who is influenced by their European training and technique, they expect that the African should stick to his traditional forms, even if he bends down in copying them. I do not copy traditional art. I like what I see in the works of people like Giacometti, but I do not copy them. I knew Giacometti personally in England, you know. I knew he was influenced by African sculptures, but I would not be influenced by Giacometti because he was influenced by my ancestors. So what would you say to that and to the extent that the Western modern art has been influenced by African art and, and how, how did that take place in the trajectory of our history? Well, it's a very apt uh, quote because it, uh, it represents the struggles of uh, African moderns at that time. Um, many of them, like Nwomu, were viewed as uh, pale copycats, you know, of modernism, of modern art, which, um, of course, has its roots in Africa. And I think this started uh, way back in um, 1884, 1885, 
with the Berlin Conference when European powers at that time were trying to share Africa, you know, for its vast mineral resources. They were, you know, allocating certain regions in Africa to themselves for exploitation, mm -hmm. you know. And at that time also, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, you know, and there was this um, Natural History Museum that was propagated at that time. And it was very important to come to Africa to collect specimens for vital experiments and research, you know, to, of course, um, prove the theory of, uh, of evolution that Charles Darwin, the great uh, biologist and scientist, had propounded. Mm -hmm. uh, so Africa was a vert fertile uh, ground to collect specimens. And along came the Europeans, and um, of course, with their conquest, you know, they came with their ideas of modernity. And of course, you know, this also influenced um, our style and our way of living. Um, in 1897, for instance, the British came, you know, to Benin and sacked the kingdom. And in sacking the kingdom, they looted away, you know, very many of the art pieces in the palace. It was even burnt down and the Oba was banished uh, to a faraway Calabar where he was exiled and many years later he passed away. You know, and with it, a lot of the sculptures found their way to the museums of France and Germany. You know, and here we have artists like Picasso, you know, who copied, you know, or borrowed heavily from um, the geometric and abstract forms of African art, you know, at that time prevalent in the sculptures. African art is what was well known for its geometric forms, its uh, psychological expressiveness and, and uh, abstraction. Mm -hmm. And at that time when modern art was birthed, it was important to break away from the stiff, prevalent academic style. So that's where a lot of the influence came. And I think this is what M. Woman was speaking of. You know, you, at that time, maybe uh, from the 1930s and 40s, you had African artists who were educated, you know, at prestigious institutions abroad. For instance, uh, M. Woman went to the Slade at University College London, where he was able to uh, learn more of the rudiments of art and a fine easel painting tradition. So his was a blending, a sort of hybrid of um, Western conventions, you know, of representation and techniques, because at that time, you know, African artists were not creating art, you know, to be enjoyed in museums or enjoyed at galleries, but uh, they largely served uh, religious purposes, you know, or uh, there were functional pieces, you know, for the home or things that you could use, you know, uh, a homeware and all of that. So, um, and, and uh, pieces that you could use to commune with your ancestors and gods, uh, for example, in the case of masks and staffs of traditional staffs of office or pieces that will proclaim the greatness of a kingdom as in the Benin kingdom where their conquest and wars were literally, you know, emplaced on plaques in the palace walls. Um, so it was very important, you know, uh, and I think that Enwo's um, legacy is hinged on his successful invention of a modern visual language that, you know, brought the best, you know, in terms of uh, Western conventions of representation and our indigenous traditions to create our own modern visual language that, you know, um, sort of defined our identity or represented, you know, our identity and who we are as Africans, because you cannot take away that influence of... Uh, uh, European modernism on us, and at the same time, you cannot you cannot um, uh, jettison our own indigenous traditions. So I think Edwin was trying to say, you know, which was very representative of the artists at that time, that uh, how can you accuse him of copying European masters when they themselves were influenced by our forefathers? Wouldn't it be right to say that he was influenced by his own forefathers? while he only used European techniques or Western techniques, you know, and modes of representation to express himself as a way from maybe just uh, having traditional pieces that would serve as signposts in a home or, or pieces that uh, would be used functionally in a home. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the reality is that human beings all, we all, we all get inspiration from each other. I mean, that is Absolutely. how we operate as human beings. I mean, that is how Absolutely. you watch even how, how children grow and how, how they develop. It's very much through, you know, looking at somebody and then saying, okay, that works and trying that out. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of exchange. And that's happened, that's happened throughout time. They've all built on each other. 
Um, Absolutely. What, what I found fascinating in, in looking, looking at this topic is the fact that um, we often think about, um, you know, the, the beginning of the colonial history, like you're remembering the you know, scramble for Africa, 1896, and the, the colonial powers coming together and dividing up, you know, West African countries uh, as colonies. What I found interesting is that in the past, um, I had never thought specifically of the um, them also kind of colonizing the culture and arts in a sense. You know, I'd always thought it was natural resources, and okay, there was you know there was groundnuts, there was oil, there was palm oil, and that's what they were there for. But also the artwork, um, and I found it. I mean, because they're going there, and they obviously you know the things are being extracted and brought back to Paris or being brought back to to, to, the, to the UK. But in, in looking into this topic, you see that. Um, you know, you see that Matisse, for instance, and Henry Matisse, you know, it, you know gets a fantastic mask that is brought from yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa. He's very good friends. He and uh, Picasso were part of the Paris, the Paris Club of, of artists who are expressing yeah. themselves and experimenting. He shows these masks, this mask to uh, Picasso. Um, I'm sure you know, you know the story. I'm, I'm just, you know, reiterating it for the viewers. Yeah. Uh, Picasso is blown away, you know, and then goes to study yeah. the, 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 the Musée de Etoirie in the Trocadero. And, uh, and, and then it goes to explore those other artifacts that have been displayed there as, you know, this is what we've gotten from the colonies. Yes. Um, and, and, and says that um, he was really, there was, a, there was a quote I found of his where it says he was, he was, uh, he felt almost like it touching his heart. He felt like, wow, this is, the, he felt yeah. almost a spiritual power without knowing, like you mentioned earlier, when you were, when in your, in, in your previous statement, you said that, you know, African art was functional, it had spiritual purposes. It was to commune with the traditional African religion, which had a supreme creator, but also had the intermediaries through the spirits and the ancestors. And so a lot of the, uh, the, the, the pieces were um, symbolic and used in these um, traditions. And he said he felt this. Um, and I found that quite amazing that he said that. And then he, he, he incorporated it into his work, you know, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, you know, there's a very clear, you know, in two you. women on the right. You've got yeah. the clear uh, representation of faces as masks, as opposed to sort of yeah. women. Um, and he admits to that, you know, it's, it's, it's very clear. Um, I found that interesting. Um, and, um, and I found it interesting that he, they, you know, the Cubists and, you know, Malek Batiz and uh, Picasso being the main Cubists, saying that he, he saw a sophistication in the abstraction. Yes. He saw a sophistication in And the other thing I would like to buttress based on what you've said, is what another uh, contemporary in that time said, which was uh, Georges Braque. And he described African masters, the opening of a new horizon for me. They made it possible for me to make contact with instinctive things, with uninhibited feelings that went against yes. the whole tradition, which I didn't like, which I hated. I mean, that's a very strong, but he actually wrote, which I hated, you know? <laughs> um, and and uh, some of Braque's work that was visibly influenced by Picasso and Cubism and African arts include the large nude in 1908. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I feel like I need to get this point in and ask yes. you this question because it's, it seems okay. to be relevant to this topic. Why do you think our art was so powerful? What, what, you see, we were not analyzed, you know, we can go through the trajectory of European art and, you know, the romanticism and the, you know, the, the, the realists and the expressionism and the expressionism and then the cubism and then the four, you know, we can kind of go through how socio-political issues affected that. And I think we're going to come yes. to that later, the Industrial Revolution, various, various issues, various developments in technology and science, you know, brought forth the ability for them to move in different directions. I just want to hear from you and your experience. Um, why do you think our art is, is so spiritually based? Well, it's very spiritual and powerful and still exists today. Mm. Um, I see um, our art uh, as having, um, as existing together with all the movements, they're still existing today, still largely pluralistic in that sense. I think it's powerful because uh, right from the, the from the earliest of times, I mean, if you trace back the art to the cave paintings, you know, it was sort of magical, you know, it, uh, I mean, the early hunters would go out, you know, but before they go out to hunt, you know, they'd uh, paint on the cave walls exactly how they wanted their hunting expedition to go. So if they wanted to, for instance, hunt at antelopes successfully, you know, they will sort of invoke that you know, and the number of antelopes, the number of men that will go on the excursions, you know, they'll paint all of those, you know, on the walls. And exactly as it, as uh, that scene is painted is the same way it'll happen in reality. 
So that for me was the beginning of linking art and magic together. And then when you think of uh, traditional African society and how you know, we exist in both the physical and the liminal worlds, you know, the spiritual worlds, you know, and that space that exists where our masquerades operate and that's a liminal space, you'd see that uh, we coexist with the spiritual. So even when our, aunts, our, our, our forebearers pass away, we still believe they're with us in spirit. Yes. You know, and they come out at festive occasions to celebrate with us. Or when a great personage you know, has passed away, you know, his uh, funeral is marked with uh, uh, a masquerade coming out to, to dance and escort him into the land of the spirits, where occasionally he still comes. So even, for instance, in Igbo society, you see that uh, you know, you know, the head of the family, the titular head of the family, who's called the Opala, for instance, you know, he, he has a staff with which you know he still communes with the ancestors, and you know, counsel is sought in many on many occasions for when important decisions are to be made in the family. So it's very important, and you have uh, you know um, sculptures that are made to represent some of these ancestors and represent some of these deities, and you commune with them. So they sort of still live with us. And I think that that's what makes our art very powerful because it's spiritual in that sense. You know, so it's not just for documenting history where you can trace, uh, you know, the history or, you know, you reconstruct the history of a people, for instance. It has a spiritual, you know, connotations which still exist today. You know, so where you see the modern man, you know, uh, who is Christian and who is even a professor, you know, he's still a chief, you know, because, you know, in his village, you know, and he still obeys, you know, or observes these traditional rituals and principles. So it's created a sort of hybrid society. And what's happening now is that uh, some of the, the those born in these times, the millennials are, you know, trying to reclaim uh, this space all over again. You know, the, um, I don't, I'll also like to add that uh, it's not only the, um, the mask and the traditional archetypes that we're taking away you know, that influenced, um, uh, as you, uh, that influenced the birth of uh, modern art as we know it. I'd also speak um, about um, the, the influence of, uh, of the West, you know, on uh, African art. And I think that came, as you mentioned earlier, with uh, rapid industrialization, the advent of Christianity. Uh, the Christian missionaries also had their great influence, you know, on African art here, for instance, in the 1940s, we had uh, Reverend Fathers uh, Frank Mahoney and Kevin Carroll, who were at uh, Oye Ekiti at that time, and who got the likes of uh, Lamidi Fakaye to inter interpret biblical themes, you right. know, using traditional Yoruba sculpture. So that is also a very huge turning point. We had uh, uh, patronage, Western patronage, you know, that influenced the, the stylistic development of African art. We had people like Oli Baya, you know, and he believed that uh, the African, you know, should create without any influence from uh, European dictates. And he felt that African art was strongly mythological. And uh, at that time, he um, got a lot of unschooled artists who had not... Uh, ...witnessed or experienced formal education. Mm. You know, who had not experienced... Uh, Sorry, that, sorry for that break, who had not experienced a formal education. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got them together in workshops in uh, the 1950s and 60s in Oshogbo. And uh, that's known today as the Oshogbo School. So you had the influence of Western patrons who also influenced the stylistic development. And that set them on a course, you know, uh, on a, a strong course against the academics at that time. People like uh, Enwomo at that time, people like uh, the Zaria Art Society members, like Yusuf Guilo, who were not happy that. Uh, you know, artists who were not schooled, for instance, you know, were dictating or were, you know, had the audacity mm -hmm. to um, dictate uh, or try to dictate uh, the flow of modern art developments in Nigeria at that time. So um, I'd also say that um, I've mentioned industrial, um, the industrial, uh, rapid industrial growth and the advent of technology as well, mm -hmm. uh, the Christian missionaries. You know, these were you know, strong influences that impacted, you know, the stylistic development. And of course, patronage, because in every society, 
you know, the styles of the artist, you know, are influenced strongly by those who are acquiring the pieces, mm -hmm. you know, and at that time, the artworks had to go through some sort of aesthetic filtering, you know, so that it's acceptable to a Western audience internationally, mm -hmm. you know, because at that time, um, artists were courted by the, the, the Western uh, folk who came here, you know, in search of jobs, in search of discoveries, you know, and of course, to propagate the uh, the gospel. So they were the patrons at that time, and they had their yeah. abiding influences that, you know, are still, you know, um, palpable today. Yes, it's interesting how there's a repetition there, isn't there? Because we look at the, um, yes. if we look at prior to kind of, you know, maybe the Enlightenment period and things like that, where art was predominantly in Europe also um, a tool for um, wealthy um, or church institutions, and they were the patrons. Yes. And so you notice that the artists then were manifesting art on, you know, on behalf of the patrons and telling stories from, you know, the, the, the Bible or, you know, spirituality and, you know, quite instructive and was telling stories to the congregation who was predominantly not so literate at that time. So they were in awe of the paintings going into the church, you know, their stories they were reading on the walls, you know, of the church of what happened, you know, um, in, 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 uh, in, in, in Christian uh, uh, theology. Um, so it's interesting. And then, and then yeah. I suppose they, they, with the industrial revolution and uh, those changes that happened, they moved away from those patrons. You know, they, those patrons became yeah. less relevant. Um, and I suppose that's also, that's also what's happened in, well, during the colonial period, we've kind of, you know, obviously we've, we've, we've had our pre-colonial art and then we've also had our post-colonial art, which has been a, a blending of those things. Um, there's a couple of questions I want to ask, and I'm wondering which ones to go first, you know, which so I don't lose my thread. Um, I found it fascinating that you just mentioned how intentional the art was. And by that, I mean, they were drawing on caves, visualizing. I mean, there's all these self-help books now on visualization and the power of visualizing, yes. the power of you yes. know, mind mapping and drawing what you want to happen and journaling and writing out what you want to achieve. And then because you've written it, it almost manifests itself. You almost, the, 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 the process of writing almost enables you to kind of realize that. So there is a, there is a, a power in the, the writing or the, the documenting, whether it's an artistic form or any other form. I find that quite fascinating, to be honest with you. Um, and I just, I wonder, I mean, is this a natural human inclination? Is this an instinctive wisdom? You know, uh, do you have any insight on this? Yes, I think it, it's uh, very fascinating, especially in Africa, because uh, in Africa, our art process is sort of in reverse from what we know it to be in the West, in the sense that we call things into being as opposed to the European artist, you know, who sees things as they are and reproduces them mainly through such uh, tools or, or yes, yeah, so or tools like um, um, foreshortening, you know, studies in anatomy, you know, and all of that. We call things that are not into being because uh, we have a sort of spiritual consciousness that the Westerner doesn't necessarily, you know, is not necessarily in touch with as much as we are. You know, our, we believe that life, you know, and art is very deeply spiritual, mm. while, you know, the Western artist from time, you know, is more interested in uh, naturalism. You know, he excelled at that, you know, all through the Renaissance period, he excelled at naturalism. It was, he was more interested in replicating what he sees, you know, to a faithful copy, you know, and that's why anatomical studies were very important. And, you know, scientists worked very closely with artists and, you know, even the great artists would, um, you know, you know, would study very extensively human cadavers to make sure he gets every muscle right. And that's where you had people like Da Vinci excel because, you know, he for me is one of the fathers of anatomical studies. You know, he would take cadavers apart and, you know, try to imagine how the veins and how the muscles, you know, and how the tendons are, how they connect to the bones, you know, it is very important for them. We were more interested, you know, in the spirituality of, for instance, if I'm going to represent, uh, you know, a human, you know, I believe I'd make his head larger because he comes to the earth with his head, you know, and his head is uh, the seat of wisdom and carries his destiny. 
So there was more significance in representation, you know, in spiritual connotations than actually just faithful rendering. And uh, for me, that was the the uh, that signaled the the um, death for me of realism when the when the camera came into being, and that's when the um, um, Westerners woke up to see that you know you have to be more expressive instead of only just uh, rendering nature you know to the best of your ability mm. yes. yes i mean that, that's fascinating so they so they were freed by by the discovery of, of, of uh yes of photography i think it's roughly 1839 they were freed yes. from having to because because painting was a source of record keeping and documentation absolutely. you know it was absolutely you know, you know, it, it, it was it was a very it was a way it was this is the way people were capturing this capturing yes. that look at the pictures you know um and they were freed from the need to do that so they could express emotion they could express concepts and this is where it all kind of absolutely together. um I, I you mentioned something which was tying into what i wanted to also explore a bit further um I, I was wondering where the and you, you've kind of addressed this actually but if you can expand on it i'd really be we appreciate that. You, I was wondering where the sophisticated abstraction in African car art comes from, because that is very particular. The, the abstraction, the way the say, let's, let's let's focus on the sculptures for now. Yes. The abstract elements is is where is where is this coming from? Is you know is it is it, it must have started? Is it the conceptual aspect, the fact that they're really focusing on the symbolism of uh, of ideas and they wanted to as you said the head is larger you know when we were talking about okay maybe this is where it's coming from and can you expand on this uh, abstraction technique for us in african art yes it comes essentially from symbolism it was very important i mean for them to symbolize uh, i mean i gave the example of the head as a symbol yeah. you know uh, of uh, wisdom you know and um, that for me is a very important example because uh, a lot of uh, uh, our figures have enlarging heads they've got several facets of the anatomy exaggerated you know and they're all symbolic they represent something in different tribes and when you imagine our diversity for instance in nigeria alone you've got uh, close to 250 you know tribes our diversity you know and think about that all over and across africa okay. it was very important uh, symbolism and I think African art symbolism has um, a very large role to play because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it wasn't necessarily for aesthetic purposes. You know, it was uh, mainly for religious purposes. Uh, we believe that our art, you know, emanated from the spiritual. So several face of, faces of the human anatomy, for instance, the head, you know, it was important to exaggerate that to mm -hmm. show its importance to our lives and its importance and you know its role in how you know we're able to chart our trajectory in the world and our purpose you know in the world so symbolism played a very important role in our art yes i'm thinking about um the impact of people like freud with his interpretation of dreams which affected how also europeans started to view expression of emotion expression of uh, the subconscious as well so i think we have the industrial revolution we've got uh, photography but also a move into people looking inside more you know being a bit more instinctive being a bit more mm -hmm. conscious and i i mean what 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 would you would you would you be able to expand on that a little bit and how it must have affected the artists you know um uh, in, in that era so 19th century artists late 19th century artists in the west or in, in africa in the west in the west because they because freud would have you know he would have you know his work would have been published and then i think artists would have realized that um they are free to express things that maybe are not traditionally expressed you know um i i, I have the idea that um at the time in western society expression of emotion expression of anything that is not uh, sort of material and and yes. seen and real was kind of suppressed, you know, uh, for whatever reason. Um, you know, we've dis we've discussed of Africans, you know, being very sort of spiritual and very much in touch with the seen and the unseen, and recognizing that there's 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 realms beyond what we have. And and you know, I think I think Afri uh, generally, I know I'm generalizing, but generally, there's they were quite expressive emotionally. You know, there's uh, you yes. know there's that, and I, I feel like there was also adding to what we've been saying. There was the liberation of the mind in that uh, in what Freud actually exposed 
Um, yes. The impact of I think I think even in painting, the history of painting, I mean, speaking about painting things that uh, were generally abhorred at that time, I think artists like uh, Gustav Kobe, mm -hmm. I mean, he was able to, I mean, birth realism as we know it, because uh, it was very strange to, you know, be emotionally connected to laborers and normal everyday folk. You know, uh, at that time, it was important. Uh, I mean, when you look at the history of painting and the great uh, uh, patrons, like the Medici family, I mean, they wanted to be um, represented in opulence. And it was, I mean, it was only the important or significant personages that were actually painted at that time. You know, so we had people like uh, even uh, Francois Millet, who um, represented the downtrodden and the pheasants, you know, so I think that was when they started getting really emotional, you know, and their emotions, they wanted to paint the suppressed, those who were laborers, they wanted to capture the emotions on their faces and the suffering and what they had gone through. So that in a way might speak to um, what you're emphasizing now, you know, yeah. when, you know, they still, and for me, that's the birth of realism as, 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 as different from naturalism, because realism, you know, had to do with suffering and emotional turmoil. I mean, that's how we describe it. And, you know, the artists of that period were very significant because, you know, it was a very strong movement. And I think for me, that was probably the first time artists, you know, got in tune with their emotions. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that, that for me is uh, that yeah. period, that time, yes. And I, and I think it also shows the um, society moving, moving from a very hierarchical sort of classist Absolutely. More egalitarian. Absolutely. You see that, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. And then, and then yes. what I do have, and then also just the, the, the commonality of human condition, you know? Absolutely. You know, we're all feeling these things. It's all, it's all the same. You know, somebody just happens to have more, more money or happens to have had an opportunity to have better education, but ultimately everybody is in the same human condition, you know? Absolutely. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, what are the some what are some of the curves and charts you see in the say if we look in the last sort of I don't know 150, 60 years in, in terms of in West Africa in the arts? Are there any trends you're seeing in that? Well, I'll speak directly to um, what has happened in the last okay, let's listen the last 70, 80 years. Okay. Um, I know that um, and we were speaking about uh, the occurrences in Benin, you know, and um, it's very interesting how that has um, even impacted on the value of art from that time, because, you know, the archetypes, you know, the Benin bronzes, which are in fact brass works, mm -hmm. you know, but they're known as bronzes, but they're brass pieces, you know, they're still being produced at uh, Eagle Street today, mm -hmm. but the value uh, is impacted or defined by the West, because uh, it's all about if they were using for ritual purposes or not, and if they've got a certain kind of patina that can be proven to show that, you know, they're actually using ritual purposes, and that's what gives them their monetary value. Right. Um, even though today these pieces are still being produced in Benin, but they're they're dismissed as just copies because mm -hmm. they've not been used for ritual purposes. Now there has been a marked shift, you know, in the way art is. Uh, uh, um, stylistically produced in the sense that we make, we've talked earlier about uh, about uh, the academic institutions, uh, rise of Christianity, advent of Christianity in Africa, Western patronage, you know, the rapid industrialization, you know, that um, uh, fueled stylistic development, you know, over the years in Africa. Now, unfortunately, you know, um, the modernists at that time, artists like Ben and Momo, who felt that uh, it was important to um, champion uh, Africans at the time of independence, you know, when we were looking for independence, I think Ghana was probably the first uh, African country to gain independence in 1957. At that time, it was very important for Africans to define themselves as Africans, you know, to carve their own identities, you know, as African countries where, you know, gaining or fighting for independence at that time. So it was important to define a language mm -hmm. that defined them, that represented them. And that's where you saw the blend, the hybrid of um, 
Western techniques and modes of representation with our indigenous traditions. Mm. And that for me is the birth of modern art in Nigeria and even in Africa. And you had all the sub-Saharan movements. Uh, I mean, we were very familiar with uh, the natural synthesis uh, theory that was propounded by members of the Zari Art Society. And those were artists who followed and one were at that time. But unfortunately, I mean, we started off with a quote by Momo in which, you know, he was uh, aggressively, you know, challenging, you know, Western stereotypes thrust on him, you know, where he and some of his colleagues were accused of, you know, bending down to either copy their own ancestors or imitate uh, the, the European modernists at that time. And he spoke up against that, you know, that it was in fact his, the Europeans who are copying you know, his own ancestors. Now, that is, is very important because um, 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 it shows, you know, this sort of uh, discourse that was occurring at that time. Mm. Um, I think that um, when these artists were dismissed as pill uh, copycats, it's sort of um, a sort of um, mm, remove them from historical canons in the sense that modernity is seen as only an occurrence, you know, that happened in Europe and in the West, you know, with dismissing, you know, other pockets of modernity that happened in other regions of Africa, for instance, and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So that for me is an anomaly in that sense. And these artists were not giving their due. You know, now today we talk about contemporary African art as if the modernists never really existed and that's why you'd see that even prices, you know, as reflected in international auctions, you mm. see that prices for modern art, you know, are not modern African art. They're not exactly where they should be. Uh, Benewa was true to the other day uh, in 2018, June of 2018, went for uh, $1.6 million. But that is a far cry, you know, when you compare $3.3 million for a much younger artist who is probably not up to 45, Injideka uh, Kinyuli Crosby, whose work, I think Bush Babies went for $3.3 million, you know, on the international art market. And that for me is a prime example mm -hmm. to show that, you know, the contemporary artists are now giving uh, significantly more uh, recognition than the modern artists who actually birthed them. Yes. And that's because the efforts of the modern masters were dismissed, you know, as copying you know, the Western artists. And that's why, you know, as early as 1946, Ewan was already exhibiting the likes of Picasso, mm. you know, all the way in Paris. But you can see there's a marked difference in the prices, in, in prices of the sales of their works, for instance. You know, Picasso, you know, sells for far much higher on a more frequent basis than what Ewan would ever command for his works. And I think it's, that was nicely summed up in Ewan's quote you know, the occurrences of that time that have led to such a discrepancy. So mm -hmm. these are some of the movements that have happened. There's been, you know, uh, a dismissal, you know, or poor recognition of the efforts of African modernists at that time, because, you know, a lot of their groundwork was attributed to the Europeans, you know, as the birth of modern art, you know, mm -hmm. dismissing what they were doing, you know, and neglecting the fact that, you know, modernity happened in other parts of, the world. It's mm -hmm. only in recent times that historians are making a case that you must take into cognizance, you know, modern art developments, other parts of the world, if modern art is an ideological break itself mm -hmm. from the academic, uh, strongly prevalent and rigid academic style. Yes. You must take into consideration other artistic canons in other regions of the world mm -hmm. for you to have an all inclusive, you know, account of modern art, and as opposed to having a Western art uh, um, uh, narrative that excludes other areas of the world. Yes. So, so I mean, what, what would you say could be done to redress this imbalance? I mean, you've, you've, you've offered this suggestion, the current one of them taking into cognizance and giving credit where credit is due and acknowledging, acknowledging you know, those, those other contributions, contributors to the modern, modern art uh, evolution in, in, the, in the world. What other, uh, what other steps could be taken? What other measures could be taken to redress this imbalance? Well, I think this critical discourse, very important, critical text. Unfortunately, in, uh, 
in Africa, we don't have enough of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have enough critical texts. And when they're penned down, for instance, they're not read in the right art capitals, you know, where they can actually impact or influence. Uh, some Africans have uh, attended some prestigious institutions and have been able to make a case for African art, but they're all making the same mistake, which I feel, you know, uh, will have um, consequences in future. And they're all pandering to that dictate to that, uh, which makes it look as if modern African artists, you know, they exist in a vacuum. Mm. You know, and starting our art as if it started from contemporary times. Contemporary times is only in our recent history, maybe from the 1950s, 1960s, which coincided with the colonial and post-colonial period here in Africa. So how can you start our African art history from that point? Yeah. You know, for uh, a profession that um, age is a very vital factor in the value of an artwork, how can you uh, lay credence to the fact that your art started from the 1950s or, I mean, uh, or very early 1960s? Then it becomes problematic in that sense because you're, 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 you are agreeing to the fact that you have, you know, um, a very, very young art history. And uh, for a profession that, you know, goes back many centuries ago and the older a work is, you know, there's more value attached to it. So essentially you're not aligning your works to achieve that sort of value, both mm -hmm. um, culturally and uh, financially monetary as well. So it becomes problematic in that sense. You must give the modernists the, 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 the real value. And in doing that, you will find out that, um, that uh, you can have more of an impact, you know, on modern art history because, you know, other developments happen in Africa as well. And if modern art, as I mentioned earlier, is an ideological break from the academic style, and some of these occurrences happened not only in Africa, other regions of the world, you must have an all encompassing account of art, modern art history. Yes, I mean, yeah. so do, do you think then, so, so why do you think it's a lack of knowledge about the, the, the depth and breadth of the history or is the pandering to do with where patronage is coming from and what, what is your view? Well, is the pandering, you know, is the pandering more than any, anything else because knowledge is out there and it can be researched. Um, what I think is more of the pandering because especially when you want to have big museum shows and uh, the sponsors would uh, sponsor what they want to sponsor, for instance. And um, um, with dwindling budgets for museums, they have to be very innovative in how they bring visitors through their doors because the visitors essentially would pay the entry fees. And when they pay the entry fees, then they have the sort of budget to which to run the oper operational cost. So I think that has a, a very significant uh, part to play. Uh, with the way that um, uh, uh, art has been appreciated from Africa and other regions of the world. You know, if you look at some of the major exhibitions like uh, Africa Remix, uh, I mean, with curators like Simon and Jami, you'd see that uh, they took into cognizance more of the contemporary artist than the modern artist. So you're not essentially weaving a proper narrative of African art. You can't tell the history of a continent by starting with the present. Mm, yes, no, definitely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, what, what I, one of the things I also wanted to, to touch on is um, what, what do you think the role? I mean, people, most, most people acknowledge, or some people acknowledge, that um, art has a role in changing or shaping society. Um, I mean, we've seen that throughout history. You know, the the the, the Benin Kingdom used their their arts to show conquest, to show power. Uh, people use art to record events, people use art as a reaction to events, people use art as a, as a moving away from a certain uh, trajectory. Um, and we see that also with uh, our African modern art as well, you know, it's, it's used to express current uh, issues and uh, emotions and ideas and, and desires. Um, what, what role do you think art has in shaping society? Well, art's role is multifaceted. I mean, you've mentioned uh, it's used even in, in uh, building a relationship with your creator on the supernatural world. You also mentioned uh, 
on the touch on the political, you know, how it's been used to proclaim the greatness of an, of an empire um, as a marker of civilization. Um, these are some of the roles, even functional purposes in the home. But in shaping society, I think uh, it's, it becomes more powerful when uh, it's used um, um, together with, uh, with other professions. For instance, uh, I believe in that uh, interdisciplinary link. I think it's very important. Uh, for instance, I'll take an example, maybe um, in climate change. You know, when you're able to see how artists can actually take um, disused objects from um, the environment, objects that have been thrown away and repurpose them into beautiful works of art that can even be sold on the international market. For me, that is a living example. You know, uh, you see artists who, because um, I frown, you know, are just using art, you know, for awareness. I think it's deeper than that. And that for me, is a prime example when the artists are actually taking objects, you know, that, you know, could, that are not, uh, that cannot be degradable, you know, and, uh, you know, actually reconstituting them into useful pieces of art. That for me, you know, is a prime example and is something that will influence policy because the changes only come at policy level and uh, also reorientate, reorienting people, you know, changing an ideology. And once you see things that are happening in the physical, you know, they're just not, it's not just for awareness purposes, but you can actually see a physical example. I think that's very important. So when you see artists working with, uh, you know, automobile engineers to use their, their disused parts, mm -hmm. artists working with uh, those climate change experts, you know, artists working with those in the government to influence policy with prime examples like that. I think that for me is the way to change society. Otherwise, you'll just have uh, uh, cases where art is just used for as propaganda, you know, for awareness. That has its impact. But I think with physical, actual examples, you know, art would, would change society um, even more positively. Yes. So, I mean, that's a very, very um, concrete example there, actually. I really like that. Um, and do you think, because quite often you find that people, you know, especially in, in, in maybe in some West African countries, some, sometimes people see art as a luxury as opposed to as a necessary part of life. Um, and I can imagine that the policy or the, the governmental uh, level, it's more difficult to convince of the necessity or to be able to have a budget for art to be as, as, as a source of social change, a source of social empowerment and as a really a vital resource um, so you've, you've, you've mentioned this as a, as a very practical way. Um, are there any other ways we can encourage, um, you know, authorities to take art to really, really give art its rightful place, actually, um, in the same way as when we had our own um, governance systems, art was, had a very, very prominent place, you know? I think that, um, was, let me speak for Africa. I think in Africa, we haven't yet won the battle. And for me, the battle is showing that art can actually um, contribute to our GDP. That really is the battle. Once we can win that battle, then I think that uh, the rest is history in that sense. Um, the governments in Africa, Nigeria, for instance, we're still grappling with uh, erratic power supply, still battling with pipe on water, and basic infrastructure. So anything that they're going to give any attention to has to be something that can change the lives of people, create jobs, um, and contribute to our GDP. And that's where artists, you know, and uh, those in the business of art, you know, have to make a case. And it begins with uh, mapping the art industry to show yes. what are the areas, you know, what is the value chain system? What are the areas that art can contribute? You know, where are the investment opportunities? Once we can win that battle, then I think that, you know, we'll be taken more importantly. As it is now, it is a luxury for a niche few, you know, who would acquire pieces. And even many of those don't even still understand the investment value of art. So there still has to be a lot of awareness in the sense that there has to be a lot of um, art as an alternative asset uh, 
seminars, for instance, so that people would also see in as much as you may enjoy art and live with the art for aesthetic purposes and for your personal enjoyment, but it's still got a value, you know, where you can store your money as well. And, you know, you've got to show how, you know, this can be, you, you can have access, access to your money at any point in time. You know, who are the trend setting artists, for instance, all of these are extremely important, you know, if we must make a case for the art. So until we do that, you know, until there's a proper mapping of our art industry, until we have the Bureau of Statistics having concrete figures, you know, you know, it will just be like going cap in hand and securing sponsorship for events every now and then, which we mustn't do. And I think that once the government sees art's vital role, you know, in uh, shaping society and contributing to our GDP, then um, struggles, for instance, you know, having a proper National Gallery of Art that mm -hmm. is not only a repository for our rich uh, heritage, you know, yeah. but uh, a way to, to challenge various uh, stereotypes thrust on us, I think that would be easy to argue. They haven't seen the value yet. They must understand arts linked to tourism and how people would come from all walks of life and come from every corner you know, of the earth to Nigeria and see how you can connect that with tourism. When visitors come, they stay in hotels. When they come to see art, they buy art, they stay in hotels, they, they, they use the transportation systems, you know, they eat at the restaurants, you know, uh, all of that, you know, contributes to the economy. So until we make a case, you know, for instance, what is the value of our art industry today? Who has thought about that? You know, you know where are the statistics to prove that? How many artists are working in Nigeria today? How many artists graduate each, each year from uh, our schools? You know, until that happens, we're going to be even having dwindling enrollments at universities and dwindling uh, uh, interest in even students studying art. And that's the reason why, you know, up till today, mathematics and other science related uh, core subjects are giving more, more um, uh, recognition. So we need to make that case. And once we do that, the rest is easy. We need to make that case. And it's a financial case more than a cultural or an aesthetically pleasing case. It is a financial case. Yes, well, that's fascinating. I mean, and there is, a, there is clearly, for me, I think there is clearly a demand for these things, but it's really sort of Absolutely. quantifying the demand and tapping into that demand and getting the information. Absolutely. I mean, places like Oshobo are just amazing. You know, we, we've got a lot Absolutely. of fantastic tourist, uh, tourism opportunities in the country. Um, Absolutely. On that note, I would like to really give you a hearty, hearty thanks for what has been a really wonderful, insightful uh, conversation and interview. Um, and thank you so much. I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot and would love to see you again. Um, we have, I've certainly learned a whole lot and just enjoyed the conversation and enjoyed learning more about, the, more about this trajectory of modern art and, and uh, the role of African art in that. Um, and I, I very much hope to see more prolific artwork coming out of the continent. I think we have some very talented people um, in the continent. I mean, we have some wonderful, wonderful works and wonderful potential. It's just the necessity to uh, concretize that. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you. And I must say thank you as well for inviting me. It's been a very exhilarating time. I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. And I must say you're quite the art historian yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we'll, be, you, we'll definitely be in touch, and I'm hopefully this is the beginning of, of these conversations, and we'll have many more. Absolutely. Thank I look forward to that.